Next week is Memorial Day weekend, and as we were preparing for this week, we were thinking about how we could set uh, next week in motion uh, this week. So we started talking about how we could think about what if we were going to die? What would our life be like if we knew that uh, the end was near? You know, we go to a lot of hospitals, and there's always some bad news when we go to hospitals, and uh, the doctors may come in, and, and they say, well, we found some serious cancer, or we found a serious problem. And one of the first questions that is always asked by the family or by the person that was diagnosed would be, how long do they have? And the doctor may say, well, you have six months, or you may have six years. But in the mind sight, as soon as we get that information, everything changes. The perception of life changes. What we do changes. We start thinking about living every day on purpose. We start thinking about the decisions I make and the money that I spend and the things that I do on purpose. Because sometimes when we look at life, we think I can live forever. We think that I'll have all my time and everything I want will be in front of me. But this one thing I know, we only have one life. And the older I get, the faster that life goes by. And the scripture says in Psalms chapter 90, verse 12, teach us to number our days that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. Present, teach us to number our days so we can present God a life, a most important wisdom. You know, when we think about what God truly wants for us, and I think it's living our spiritual life on purpose. More importantly, what in the world are we going to do? Your legacy is something that you create someday. It is something that you are creating right now. Our legacy is when somebody stands before you at your memorial service. The eulogist will speak. The pastor will share. And he will say things about you that you lived. There's a phrase that I use at every memorial service. It is this, I cannot say a life that he or she had not lived. When we speak of you, we think about our life. We need to live our life as we are dying. Because the Bible says it's a point under man once to die. Every one of us will pass. Every one of us need to realize that our life today counts. Listen to what Steve Jobs quoted before he passed. Remembering that I'll be dead soon is the most important tool I've ever encountered to help me to make big choices in life. Because almost everything, all external expectations, all pride, all fear of embarrassment or failure, these things just fall away in the face of death, leaving only what is truly important. When you have to face one of the most hardest things within your life to face death head on, what are we going to do? If we had one month to live, one day to live, one year to live, what would we change? What would be our attitude about that change? Because I believe if we would be totally honest within our life, there are certain things within our life that if we were honest with God, God would say, I want you to live more intentionally. I want you to live for me intentionally. Because we think that we have a long time. There's a rope up here. And this rope represents our life. And the average person lives today, Now I'm gonna just say the average person lives today 78 years. That's good for some, it's bad for some, but 78 years. So this rope is 39 feet long. It represents six inches for every year of your life. Six inches for every year of your life. And there are some things that we have to do with our life. There are things that are intentional, things that we absolutely do without any problems because it is just life. Like when you look at what's going on within your life, 
You think about, well, I have to do certain things. Um, I have to eat. I have to eat. And we usually eat a lot sometimes. So we're going to take over those 78 years, if we would take all of our food, every dinner, every lunch, every breakfast, every snack that we have ever eaten, and we piled it all into one time frame, that lunch would take six years. Gone. Off our life. Just because we're hungry. Just because of something that we do every... Now, after we eat, after we eat, what do we need to do? We take a nap. We take a nap. So after we eat, we take a nap, and usually, for some of us, we sleep a good eight hours, sometimes six hours, but the average is about eight hours, uh, and that is almost a third of your life. 26 years asleep. Almost a third of our life. So if we take 26 years, that's 13 feet, 26 years of our life gone because we eat too much and we sleep. 26 years with our eyes closed. Wow. Our rope is getting shorter. So after we have slept for 26 years, then we have to somewhat be productive. We have to earn a living. We have to go to work. We have to do certain things. And, and the average person works about 40 hours a week. When you look 40 hours a week, that's 18 years. If we live to 78 years and we be productive, that's 18 years that we are working. Man, you know what? Our life is going by fairly fast. Now, wouldn't it be nice if, say, at the end of this month that you can just retire and say, I am done from now on. I'm never going to do another work. I'm never going to work again. So when you say that, then what, you know, then we have to, we're done with work. It gets to be seven o'clock at night. Then we want to do what? We want to chill out. We want to watch some TV. Sometimes we get on our phones and sometimes we play with Facebook. And so either watching TV or on our phone, playing with Facebook or doing whatever we want to do, we average 2.6 hours a day playing around, and that is 10 years of our life. Just playing with social media, watching TV, watching sports is 10 years of our life. Gone. Just like that. And we think about that. Then we think about after we're getting, uh, you know, we haven't even got dressed yet. So guys, um, how many guys, if we would be honest with us, how long does it take guys to get dressed in the morning? It's probably going to be about uh, right there. That's about the guy thing right there. Just, we just put on a shower, shave, put on our coat, and we're, we're done. But girls, ladies, you're quite different. Uh, you stand in front of a mirror for hours looking at yourself to make sure that you don't look too terribly bad. But when you look at that, we spend two years of our life getting ready, being prepared visibly. So, another, there you go. And the last one is getting places. Point to point, taking kids to the soccer fields, going to work, playing around, whatever we need to do. If sometimes we look at whatever we have to do, it takes us six years of our life to take kids to where they need to go, to get to work, to go on vacation. We're in our car, we're transporting people. We are in our car doing what we have to do to get where we wanna go. It takes six years of our life. So when you think about that, and that's just the stuff that we have to do, our 39 feet, our 78 years, have gone down to this overflow. We have about, in our life, 10 years of life that we have to make decisions on. We have to work, we're going to sleep, we're going to eat, we're going to do recreational things. But there are things that we have to do intently and on purpose, or our life will be so fleeting, it'll go away so fast, that we'll look back and say, where did all of my life go? And when we look back at life, we can be 50 years old, 60 years old, 70 years old, and we can look back and say, oh, I wish I would have done this different. I wish I could go back and change. But in reality, in our life, there is no do-overs in life. Because at the end of life, it is what it is. We are where we are. 
So if I only had one month left, if I only had a year left, if I could think I had five years left, what would I do different where I am now in order to finish well, in order to start the legacy? The first thing it says is number your days. Number your days. Teach us to number our days that we may present to you, O Lord, a heart of wisdom. I want to be wise. I don't want to just live my life for myself. I want to live my life for you. Have you filled your calendar up with the right things or have you just filled the calendar up for the first things? Because sometimes we get busy doing what everybody else wants us to do. We don't do what God has asked us to do. And if we fill our calendar up for the busy, sometimes we leave out the important. Sometimes you have to say no to the good things, to say yes to the important things, to the great things. If we do not, we look at our life and then we're so busy. And the first thing that we do is we leave God off our calendars. We leave prayer off of our calendars. We put so much time being busy with others, we leave out the priority and that is God. You have made my life no longer than the width of my hand. My entire lifetime is just a moment to you. At best, each of us is like a breath. Psalms chapter 39, verse five. Life, the Bible says, is like a vapor. It's here today and gone tomorrow. So we have to take intentionally, how am I going to make my decisions so I can live my life? So when I have that purpose, I can say, I'm going to number my days. I'm going to make my decisions. But how do we make those decisions? I think the second thing is to define your values. Define your values. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18, it says, we fix our eyes on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. We have to have an eternal perspective of our values. We have to have an eternal perspective of what is important. What am I living my life for? When I finish, I want to look back at my life and I want to have that legacy. I want to have that value in my life that they can see me and they can say, this is who he was. When they stand up at your memorial service, that value, that legacy that they know that he meant good. He spent his time. He did what God wanted him to do. He fixed his eyes not only on the temporary, but he fixed his eyes on the eternal. And when we can do that, we can say, we can ask these questions. What do you believe in? What really matters to you? What values will you govern your life and your live your life by? What values do you want to pass on to your children? If something was valuable to you, it's important to you, it is not only yours. God wants us to not only just sit in the, in the chairs and enjoy life, he wants us to impact life. And when we impact life, there are some fundamental truths that we have to go with. And these eight fundamental truths are these. Grace, giving people more than they deserve. When I come across somebody's life, and God has brought them into my life. I want them and I need them to see Bruce was a man of grace. They may have failed him. He has may have failed someone else, but he loves them. He's a man of grace. Give them more than they deserve. Make them feel better than they need to feel. Make them feel more important than they could possibly feel on their own. And then hope. A conviction that God is always going to be present in their life. When I go to the hospital rooms, when I see somebody that's going through struggles, when I have the privilege of kneeling my knee before their bed and laying my hands on them and praying for them, I want to give them hope. And it's not hope in what I have given them, it is hope that God is in the midst of their life. And if we can give people hope, if we can give people encouragement, we are leaving a legacy, a value system that's important. Faith means a real depth in the relationship. 
I, I want people to understand my faith is real, and if they have a relationship with me, I can help them within their faith. I can give them inspiration to get into the Word of God, to show them that faith is something that I can grab a hold of, and God could change their life. And then love means to love the unlovely. Love the hurting. When people are struggling, they need to be able to see in us a love. In most cases, they would walk in and they would be repelled. But if we want to leave a lasting legacy of God in our value systems, they need to be able to see that we, the God's children, have love even for the unlovely. And then justice. Justice. A conceit based on the favor of the disadvantaged. I want to understand that I will stand for everyone. I want to show justice, and justice is right. If somebody is wrong, they're wrong. But if somebody is right, they're right. I want to love them in spite, but I cannot help them get out of their situation, but I can love them through their situation. When we go to the jails, we go up to county jail or the city jail, El Dorado, or we go to Hutch. And we sit in this room and talk to them and, and uh, they tell the stories. There's nothing we can do except for pray for them, love them, and help them. We want to make sure that they know that even though they did something wrong, God still loves them who they are. Justice is not throwing somebody away because they did something wrong. It's loving them even though they did something wrong. We could all, we could all be in that pen. We could all go to jail. We've all done things that have crossed the line. God has blessed us. He has kept us. He's made us something special. And it's only because of the favor of God. So we need to love people and help people. And then give people joy. Uh, 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 an ability to enjoy life. Joy. We need to be not the, the holy frozen that absolutely hates what's going on. But if God has redeemed us, if God has loved us, and God has given us an eternity, there's something within our life that we should radiate joy, peace, and happiness. Not negative, not, oh me, it's oh my. Look at what God has given to me. And then the seventh is service. Meaning is focused in service rather on self-centeredness. Service. One of the values is, is we get to serve. We get to help. It may be small. It may be water in the weeds. Or water, around here it would be water in the weeds. <laughs> water in the trees. Watering the plants or cutting the grass. Cleaning the church. Whatever it is. It is service. How can I serve to let people know they're important? And I believe one of the most important values is peace. Not just the absence of fighting, but a positive, well-rounded relationships. When we can have peace, we can have what God wants us to have. And then the third thing is release your worries. If you have 30 days to live, you have a year to live, there are things that you have to do. There's going to be some things that you want to do. But there are going to be things that you have to do. And those things that you have to do are internal issues that are very difficult to do. There are things that we have to release our worries. There's going to be people that you have to restore a relationship with. There's going to have to be people that you may have to ask forgiveness of. There's going to be things that take place that you have done within your life that you're going to have to say, I need to give that to God. I have to do certain things. Because at that last moment, you have to look at your life and know that my life is almost over and I have done everything within my life to count my days and do them well. In Matthew chapter 26, 
I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 6, verse 27, it says, Who of you wor worrying can add a single hour to his life? Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Isn't that true? Each day has enough trouble. You can't worry about things like that. If you can worry about something, then you can pray about it. The only difference is the outcome of what you pray about. If you're going to worry about it, you're taking it upon yourselves, you're anxious about it, you know, might as well just pray about it and say, God, I am not in charge of this. And when you pray about it, compared to only worry about it, the outcome is you can solve it or you can ask God to solve it and which side you think will be successful. We can't add one more day to our life. We can't worry about everything. And the Bible says in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition and thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Whenever you think about releasing your fears and your worries, there's always those pains within your life. But if we are going to live like we are dying, healing has to take place. Healing in our own soul and healing in other people's lives. Because those hurts and scars that we have lived through can do something when we say we need to talk. We need to deal with this. And as we talked last week about communication, one of the greatest things that we could ever do is to open up a line of communication that has been sealed and has hurt, and all we have done is stuck our head in the sand because of the pain. We don't want to deal with the pain. We ignore it. But if we are going to live intentionally, and if we are going to think about, I'm going to live because I'm acting like I'm dying, I have to be intentional, and I have to be honest. I have to be honest with myself, and I have to be honest with others. Live intentionally. Release our worries. We must be able to forgive. We have to be able to love. You know, stress in our lives causes all kinds of pain. Um, and I found this uh, traits of characteristic traits of a stressed individual, somebody that's overly stressed, somebody that lives over stress, somebody that, that, that does everything and he's like really high strung. Here's, the, here's some of the, the traits. He plans, day, he plans his day unrealistically. First to arrive, last to leave. He's always in a hurry, makes no plans for relaxation, feels guilty about doing anything other than work, sees unforeseen problems as a setback or disaster, is always thinking about several other things when working, feels the need to be recognized and overextends because of this. He just feels like he's overworked. And then here's the problem after they fail. They go through their life, they've worked and they've been that way for 15, 20, 25 years. And at the end of their workplace, the conclusion, the symptoms of a stressed, overloaded, broke person, decisions, making, decision making becomes difficult, both major and minor. Excessive daydreams or fascinations about getting away from it all. Increased use of cigarettes and or alcohol. Increased use of tranquilizers or uppers. Thoughts trail off while speaking or writing. Excessive worry about all things. Sudden outbursts of temper or hostility. Paranoid ideas about, mistreat, about being mistrusted. And the friends and family leaving them, leaving them deserted. Forgetfulness for appointments, deadlines, and dates. Frequent spells of brooding, feelings of inadequacy, ne negativity, and depression. Reverses all of his usual behavior to be somebody different. Sometimes when we get to stress overload, we do not think properly. And sometimes when we become so overwhelmed, stressed, we go into this depression and we feel like everything is against us and we do not know what we're doing. So we flip the switch and we just want to be somebody totally different. What happens? We have to release that. We have to release our stress, 
our personality, our failures, and our fears and give it to God. Release our worries, our fears, our stress, and say, God, I am your child. I am created for something bigger than this, something better than this. I need to give to you my fears. And the fourth thing is live for something bigger than yourself. Live for something bigger than yourself. There are certain things that you can invest your life with, and they are all temporary. But there are some things that you can invest your life that will last forever. When we're talking about investments, we're talking about people. And investing our time is the most valuable asset that you have. Investing time. Not only in your family, not only your kids, but investing in people for an eternity will change people's perception. And what we can do is we can change the way that we live like we are dying when we look at people and say, I have a plan, I have a purpose, I'm going to live for something bigger than what I want, bigger than myself. And in Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 through 27, it says this, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world and lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? For the Son of Man will come with his angels for the glory of his Father and will judge all people according to all of their deeds. What can you gain if you lose your own soul? What do you, what do you gain? What we have to do is we have to understand there's something bigger. And what I want to do is I want to live my life to honor him, to have that relationship and to know that I do not have to live in this mundane. I could be inspired to do something great for the cause of Christ. And then fifth thing is understand what you were made for. Understand what you were made for. You know, tomorrow is a gift. And that gift that tomorrow has, every one of us must receive. That gift of life, that gift of health, that gift of eternity, and the gift of faith. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, what have you done with that gift? At the end of the day, when you're healthy, do you thank God for that gift? At the end of the day, when you look at your kids and they're running around and they're healthy, do you thank God for that gift? Because I guarantee you, you can go to the children's hospital and they are so thankful for life and they give God the glory for every moment that they have with that child. But sometimes that gift is not as healthy. Sometimes those relationships are not as healthy. Sometimes our own health, they're not as healthy. Can we say thank you to God in the midst of adversity? Can we live through that gift? Because the question is, do you understand the gift that God has given to you? And the next question is, what are you doing with this gift? What are you doing with the gift of life? I want to challenge you that the first thing you have to give, you have to give God your life. You have to allow God to take over your life. You know, he has created you to be you. Your personality, the way that you talk and the gifts that you have, it is yours. And he said this, he said, I'm gonna create you and I wanna give to you the gift of life. But how you spend this gift is totally up to you. You can spend every penny that you have. You can do anything that you want. My gift to you is life. And he asks you this. He says, but what I would truly desire, what I truly want from you, is that you give what I have given to you you give it back to me. Not because you can't do it on your own. It's because you can't have reconciliation without you giving your life back to me. See, the scripture is very clear. And it's the most easy verse in the Bible, John chapter 3, verse 16 through 18. For God so loved the world so much that he gave us one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into this world not to judge the world, 
but to save the world through him. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him, but anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God, the one and only Son. The life that you have given, Jesus came to give you life. And if you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you have already been judged and that judgment is you have been paid in full for every sin, every condemnation that is against you. God has forgiven you. You are forgiven. The past, the present, and the future sin has all been laid at the cross of Christ. And God says, paid in full. There shouldn't be another person in your life that could ever condemn you because Christ has forgiven you. That's the gift. The gift of life is eternal life. He may have promised us 70 years. We may live 79 years. We may eat up our life and we may do all kinds of different things. But at the end of our life, we have to know that my life counted and I'm going to close my eyes. I'm going to usher into heaven and I know that God is going to look at me and he's going to say the most important things that he could ever say to anyone. Well done. Thy good and faithful servant. You have served me well. You have spent your life doing the important. The gift of life that I have given to you, you have shared with others. Because it is said in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, all of us have sinned. And all of us fell short of the glory of God. You know, it's the life that you have. Every one of us has been given the gift of life. But what we do with that gift is important because right here it says, all, every one of us have sinned. You know, I like talking to little kids and you know, they're, they're wanting to get baptized and they're coming in, they're six, seven, eight years old and they get baptized so their parents come in and, and I sit down and I ask them a question. I said, I said, I need to ask you a few questions. I said, okay, first question, have you ever sinned? They look at their mom. Uh, no. I said, okay, do you think your mom has sinned? Uh-huh, yeah. I said, I said, you know, everybody sins. And they look at their mom again. They say, I, I have sinned. And like they're afraid that they're going to get in trouble by their mom. But you know, even as a child, as a young child, we have to realize we're all sinners. And there's no way that we can gain access to heaven until we admit to God that I am broken, that I'm a sinner. And I need that reconciliation. I need that forgiveness. And then the Bible says in Romans 10, 19, if we confess the Lord Jesus Christ with our mouth, that he is our Lord, he will forgive us. He will love us. He will give to us the very desires of our heart. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. You shall be saved. That's a promise. We look at these things and say that you did go to the doctor this week. Say that that doctor gave you some very difficult news. Say that doctor came in and said, you know what? Your life is about ready to change. Your life as you know it is never going to be the same. You have a little bit of time on your hands. I need you to start thinking about what you would do. I need you to think about the things that you want to do. You may need to make your bucket list. You may do some things that you've always dreamed about doing. You may look at your relationship list and you may have to talk to people to restore some things. You may have to do some things that are very difficult. But your time is short. You need to live. You need to live hard. You need to be intent because you're going to die. What would you do? And we all know the song that I'm about ready to play. It's a song that dreams. It's a song that we love. It's a song that gives us encouragement. It's my twin brother, Tim McGraw, that uh, <laughs> sings this song. And... Uh, um, as an invitation, 
as an invitation today, I just want to listen to this song. And I want you spiritually to put your life in this song. Would you do the things if you needed to die? If you knew that you had cancer and you knew it was going to be tough, you had six months, you had a year to live, what would you do? Because I truly believe the only way that we're going to live and live well is if we understand the way that we live is intentionally. And the way that we live spiritually is to live for the plan, live for God, live for eternity, know that Christ wants and desires something great for you. Listen to the song and put yourself in this song.
to live like you're dying. The most intentional thing that you can do is the gift of life that God has given to you. Live it well. Serve God. Make God the priority to know we are all going to die. We have been promised a life, but that life, we can't respend it. Once we have spent, it's gone. Decisions that we have made, the things that we have done, make sure on, ten, on being on purpose serving God. Our life is going to be all cut up one day. There's two things I want to challenge you with. Make sure God, make sure you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. That is the most important decision that you can make to spend your life for him. And the second thing is make sure that when you spend your life, you're spending it in the mind, in the heart, in the decisions to serve and to love others. It's not about yourself. It's about honoring God. Giving God your life and then serving him through your life. Because at the end of your life, when you look at your life, you look back and you say, all right, the legacy that I have left is good. I could write my eulogy and I can say I served. I've done well. But we can all have that perspective. We could all dream big dreams. But when we pass, if we lived our life as we were dying, the eulogist will stand behind the pulpit. Your casket will be right here. And the words of that eulogist will say things about you, about how you lived, how you made that impact, that you pointed them to Christ or that you gave them inspiration. It is how you live your life that people will share about your life. The legacy that we leave does not start when we end. The legacy that we leave starts at the beginning. It starts now. Let's live well. Let's honor God. Let's give him our life, not only spiritually, but physically, and let God do what he will. Okay, I'm going to ask one of our deacons, Spencer, uh, to come up. And he